USMNT analysis. What do we learn? What's coming up next for the Americans? Obviously, two wins out of two, beat El Salvador, advances to the Nations League semifinals, as you can see there. Andy, you were uh, on PST uh, covering both of these games, uh, had player ratings, analysis throughout. And, and what did you make of these performances? Uh, and both from a team aspect, but also individually, there was quite a few players that stuck out in these games. And it's kind of hard in some of these Nations League games to take too many yeah. um, sort of sweeping judgments of, of where we're at. But there were a few that we could take away from these US games. Well, we shouldn't read too much into beating the 163rd ranked nation in the world. 7-1 yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it, it was nice to see them go down to Grenada and dominate the way that we said that we wanted to see them do and to do it immediately. It wasn't a slow start. It didn't take them 15 or 20 or 30 minutes to get out of the starting gate. They scored after four minutes. I think they scored after four minutes in the second half as well. So they came out after the restart and just started very quickly, very aggressively and said, the game is on us. We have the onus to drive this game. And they just went out and did it. Now they were, uh, you know, massively overmatching the opposition, but to see goals, from Ricardo Pepe, the way that they got two of them against Grenada and then another one against El Salvador. Very, very encouraging. Uh, Christian Pulisic with the set piece delivery, getting really involved. Weston McKinney getting a couple goals against Grenada. Uh, it just ticked a lot of boxes, I think, of getting some players some confidence back that maybe haven't had it. And Pepe being the obvious one, you know, he makes the move to Augsburg last year. It just it was a disaster, an absolute disaster, and loaned out uh, to Groningen in the Dutch League, and he scored nine goals there this season. But I think there's big questions over, does that translate to a uh, better European League, first of all, and then two, coming back into the national team. And so to see him get on the score sheet three times in two games, probably the biggest takeaway um, and the biggest uh, an answer to the biggest question that we have had for, I don't know, Nick, 20 years since we've had uh, someone that we felt, uh, ah, we know who the number nine is for the U.S. men's national team. Nick, is that your takeaway as well from this international window that Ricardo Pepe potentially still very, very young, but it's kind of almost the go-to guy right now because there are other options, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But what did you make of his performances and his finishing and how high are you on him? Because there are links to PSV Eindhoven, a potential move there this summer, making that next step up in Europe. Um, would seem like kind of a good place for him to develop. But your thoughts on Pepe yeah. and two big wins for the U.S.? Key, key word develop and yeah. I, I, you know i'm excited again i think with all due respect to el salvador has really built up their program i think it's at a spot it hasn't been in a long time and i have a lot of respect for the way they play and the system and the really good things being done there all that said what we talked about before as andy referenced was go out there and just be the superior team twice do it mm -hmm. do it twice and although obviously it was a close game on the score sheet against El Salvador, um, they did that. And that they did it without Tyler Adams and Tim Weah, arguably two of their three or four best performers at the World Cup, right? So mm -hmm. I guess the way I look at it is I don't think the center forward position is going to be fixed. <laughs> it's sad. I still think Tim Weah is their best option. But as you said, it gives you the chance to at least feel the way you did when Josie was in his prime. You know, before when Josie goes from scoring like crazy where in the Dutch league to Sunderland and has a rough go of it. He was still a fine player. He was still a CONCACAF player, but for me, I'm still keeping my sights high. And that means trying to develop a striker who is above the CONCACAF level. And I, I just don't want to fall into the gap as we do every world cup qualifying cycle. Although this isn't world cup qualifying, which is, Oh God, it's so hard to win down there. Right. It is, but go do it. Yep. You know, go do it. Find a way. And Mexico is not at their best right now. They found a way to draw Jamaica because, you know, uh, and, and you still expected them to go win. I want the U.S. to expect to win and most times to win. At least show the performance. Andy, talk about performances of the number nines then. Who else kind of emerged as options? Maybe not during this, but in recent form and uh, also uh, Voller and Balogun. We talked about him last time. Obviously, <laughs> that is... Uh, kind of gathering steam a little bit with Anthony Hudson, the interim USMNT coach, saying, yeah, there are discussions. We're showing him around. We're kind of, you know, uh, trying to intrigue him and dangling the carrot there. Um, so I guess, is he kind of the obvious option alongside Pepe and DK and, and Josh Sargent and a, a few other names out there that I'm sure are going to, I'm sure are going to get plenty of uh, minutes between now and the summer um, because it kind of just is that revolving door and a rotation right now. But 
Pepe's done himself no harm whatsoever in this window. Yeah, I, I would say DK, uh, a situational option, um, given maybe injuries when a roster is put together or a late game situation set pieces, somebody that can come in and cause a bit of chaos uh, inside the penalty area. That's good to have. That's a type of player that the U.S. didn't have uh, for the World Cup and, and, and hasn't had for quite a while. Um, so I think he's useful in, the, in that position. Jesus, Jesus Ferreira will, will continue to get a number of opportunities just because uh, and especially if Greg Berhalter is brought back as head coach, the way uh, that Berhalter likes the team to play, have a number nine that can almost play as a false nine and really operate with the ball at his feet and be as much of a playmaker uh, as a goal scorer in that position and, and set up Pulisic, set up Reina, set up Aarons, and set up Wea to, to Nick's point earlier. Uh, and so I, I like that there's different options, but it, it not to be overly simplistic, but if they get Balagoon, he has the highest ceiling of any of these players that we're talking about. He has the best track record in a European league at this point of his career. And oh, by the way, still 21 years old. And, and so there's just so many more levels, it feels like, for him to go up to. Whereas with all of these other players that we're talking about, they might be at their peak. They might not. They might have another one or two steps to go. But it just feels like Balagoon is it, different gravy is, is the phrase that they use over there, right, Joe? Different gravy is what it feels like. It feels like the caliber of player at the center forward position uh, that we have certainly not produced in the U.S. and developed in the U.S. Um, and so if he, is, if he decides to come over and at this point, it seems like all things are, are pointing in that direction, then I think we can begin to get a little bit more excited about what the potential is for this team in, in just over three years at the next World Cup. Yeah, hopefully we're chatting go, go, flow for the USA uh, in 2026. <laughs> so, it, Nick, I'm looking at sort of what next for the US. Andy mentioned there the game against Mexico next month and a friendly. Then obviously now there's a, a big a Nations League semifinal against Mexico and the Gold Cup. Uh, coming up as well that the U.S. are in. So there's a lot um, of potential for this team to grow and develop. And, you know, we know the situation with Craig Bohalter with the investigation. Uh, he's been cleared of any uh, wrongdoings that available to become the next U.S. head coach again, uh, kind of retake his old role if possible. Um, but Anthony Hudson, the interim head coach right now, he's done a decent job, I think. Obviously, he's been an assistant there for a while, but it almost seems like this is, Pretty much Bill Halter ball with a few little tweaks here and there. Maybe the intensity attacking wise is a little bit different, but it's all very similar. And the style of play seems very set. The squad, the players seem very comfortable in this. So it's all kind of getting to the next stage now, this development of this team. We talked about it a lot. The final third, you said about it, beat teams comfortably that you're meant to be beating. So um, in terms of what, what is next for the team, really excited for these next few months and this summer to see how far they've developed after that great show and at the World Cup in Qatar. Yeah, and I, I can't help but getting meta or, or even going higher than the situation, excuse me, and thinking, well, tell me who the sporting director is going to be because yeah. yep. I'll go back to this. As much as we just heard Christian Pulisic mentioning the um, over the break talking about, or, sorry, over one of the last international breaks talking about how they needed ideas in the final third. Mm -hmm. I still want to see changes there. I don't want to... I don't want the hierarchy getting excited because you scored seven goals uh, against a team. You should probably score four goals against every time you play them. In fact, I think they're averaging five and a half during the nation's league. So uh, for me, it is, it is continuing to develop these players and, and, and not pretending as we do sometimes in America and sometimes abroad as well, that coaches are not they're in there. And there's a lot, there's a big supply. Right. There is a deep well of coaches who can do a job. There's a lot of bad coaches as well. Don't get me wrong. But if you're telling me in the United States of America, are you more likely to find another Gio Reyna or another Greg Berhalter? I'm going to lean on the player because yeah. we're just not doing that yet. I'm going to go the other direction on that real quick, just because so many players have come out and whether prompted or unprompted, given a lot of support to Berhalter and not just, oh, you know, we like him, but talking about how he helped them develop individually and how he brought the team along and how the program grew under him. And, and, and I don't know, that, that feels to me, if you've got 22 on side and you've got one offside and, and it's... Sure, but 
here's the thing. I, I don't mean to dig this up because honestly, I have felt the most incredible surge of whether it's compassion or empathy for what Greg Berhalter has had to go through. And I think a lot of people are being swayed by that because of the great emotions involved. And I just want to point out that in September, you said Tim Ream didn't fit your program. He went out, was the best center back in the World Cup. Sure. Um, forget the Reina thing for a second. In a do or die game against the Netherlands, in a game you could have scored and Pulisic could have scored earlier, you uh, trot Jesus Farrell out there who hadn't played a minute in the World Cup, and then you have him out for Haji Wright at halftime. I just I can't reconcile those two things. I think yeah. they'll be fine with him. I think they'll be fine. But I want to be better than fine. This might be the last World Cup we see on home soil. We know how well hosts can do on, on home soil. I just don't want to pretend that he was the only guy. And they're entering their prime now. That's the thing. That's what we saw last night. They are now, there's no more. Well, this is the youngest team we've ever put out there, right? This yeah. is the next five, six years are set up for them. Five or six years. And you have to believe that on balance, Burhalter is going to take you to a level you haven't gotten to before. And maybe that's possible, right? Um, it, you know, 2002 is our is our capstone, but... Yeah, I don't know. I, I got a, a lot of worry about that. Right now, obviously, we talk about the golden generations. It feels like they can be, but it's almost like a silvery generation right now, <laughs> players. And then it's yeah. like, okay, how they develop between now and the next three years in the World Cup on home soil, that's going to be what defines this generation of players mm -hmm. and probably the program moving forward for another 10, 15 years after that. So it is exciting to see who's going to be coming in. And like Nick said, sporting director, head coach, let's see. Uh, what happens on that score. But we saw in this international break, the U.S. has continued that progress from the World Cup. They're now looking to kick it on a few gears this summer, these big games against Mexico, the Gold Cup. So really excited uh, to see all of that. And again, a couple of other players, Miles Robinson coming back, Gio Reyna obviously putting aside all the off-the-pitch issues and, and playing pretty well in these games as well. So um, a lot of positives for the USMNT. So head over to Pro Soccer Talk and embassysports.com for all the analysis, video highlights, and reaction uh, from these games. And of course, remember, you can watch uh, USMNT games uh, on Peacock and Telemundo across all our platforms. So we'll have you covered with all things US Men's National Team.